we should start. Mm -hmm. uh, hello, everyone. Welcome to our presentation about Cinder's reliability and scalability. Uh, I am Michał. This is Gorka. Uh, we are both on Cinder core team focusing on this, uh, these efforts. So just a glimpse of the uh, agenda. Uh, we'll be talking about keeping the, ser the Cinder alive. So we'll explain how to deploy HA Cinder, uh, how to keep Cinder alive during an upgrade and how to keep your volumes alive uh, through volume replication. So just a quick uh, overview of the architecture of Cinder. Uh, this is the initial set of services you need to run Cinder. And this is very similar to how Nova looked like in uh, Folsom, because Cinder was forked out of Nova in Folsom. And the basic flow is very simple. So uh, Cinder volumes are uh, talking with storage backends and gathering capacity information. These are reported to Cinder Scheduler. And when user wants to create a volume, Cinder API passes the request to Cinder Scheduler. The Scheduler chooses the uh, host based on that information. And then uh, the request is passed to Cinder Volume. And Cinder Volume is creating a volume in the storage backend. For existing volumes, uh, Cinder Scheduler is bypassed because we already know where the volume is located. That information is saved in the DB. And sometimes Cinder volume can communicate with each other, uh, for example, in case of volume migration. These are typical host boundaries you have uh, in Cinder deployments. So Cinder API and Cinder Scheduler are considered control plane services and are placed normally on the controller node. And when you are running uh, local drivers like LVM or NFS that need access to the uh, storage uh, locally on the physical node, you are running them in the same uh, physical node, the storage node. And now I'm introducing Cinder Backup Service, which is optional. It enables backups. And this is a more difficult service because before Mitaka, uh, it was tightly coupled with the Cinder Volume Service because um, mm, it was talking directly with the storage backend. And there are some assumptions with access to the storage backend. And that was before Mitaka. It needed to be on the same, uh, same physical node. After Mitaka, it communicates through Cinder Volume Service. So right now, it is decoupled. And you can, uh, you can place it, the Cinder Backup Service anywhere and scale it as needed. So just want to uh, show that uh, some people, when they're using some kind of remote driver like Ceph or any black box proprietary array, are running Cinder Volume as a control plane service, which is fine, because Cinder Volume is uh, like a proxy to the storage backend then. But uh, this uh, may mean that, for example, during volume migration, the uh, data will go through the control plane, which is kind of scary sometimes. But people do that. So if that wasn't complicated enough, I will try to explain how to. Uh, I will introduce even more complexity and explain how to do HA of these services. So Cinder app is kind of uh, easy. It's stateless, and uh, HTTP protocol is stateless, so you can just run it behind a load balancer, multiple services in a HA, in a active active HA manner. Uh, so the combo of keep alive D and the HA proxy will uh, make sure that requests are passed only to the uh, living Cinder API instances. There is one problem in uh, pre Newton Cinder API. Uh, so we had uh, some race conditions with. Uh, with statuses, and this is the this is what was what it was like before Newton. Uh, so in various places we had checks like that. So there's an obvious race condition between getting the volume from the DB, checking its status, and changing the status. Uh, so when running multiple Cinder APIs, it may happen that uh, two Cinder APIs were starting uh, some kind of flows uh, in parallel, which, for example, in this retype flow, uh, no, isn't isn't really safe. And uh, that changed in Newton in most of the places to uh, use conditional updates. So this is an SQL uh, update instruction with multiple words and uh, moves all, the, all that logic into the database. So it's atomic operation and should be safe. Uh, Cinder scheduler is even easier because uh, you don't really need to, um, to have a load balancer because RabbitMQ or any other broker Will, uh, will serve as a load balancer. So you're just running multiple Cinder schedulers in, uh, on different nodes, and you have the redundancy. 
uh, that requests will be distributed uh, by, in case of RabbitMQ, in a round-robin fashion. And uh, there's one problem with uh, that. So uh, these schedulers have their own uh, information about, uh, uh, about the status of the, um, of the Cinder volume services. So it may happen that if you are running out of capacity, uh, two, two Cinder schedulers will independently schedule a, a volume on a Cinder volume that can only um, have one another volume. So only one volume will win the race condition and get onto the Cinder volume uh, be created. Like the second one won't have any place left, so it will be rescheduled. So that's the same problem as Nova Scheduler has. Um, now I will hand over to Gorka, who will talk about Cinder volume. Thank you. So the Cinder volume is different from the API and the scheduler because it doesn't support currently active-active uh, configurations. Uh, there are multiple reasons for this. Uh, first, uh, we require mutual exclusion in some of the, of the Cinder core uh, operation as well as in, in some of the drivers. And uh, currently we are doing it with file logs. So we, we require a distributed mechanism here. We also have problems with the cleanup that is tightly coupled to our current architecture. So uh, it's, uh, we need a new mechanism, more powerful, that will allow us to, to prevent multiple uh, nodes from the same cluster for, from interfering with the cleanup of uh, other services in that same cluster. And we also require a mechanism from the API to, to request cleanups uh, uh, to request cleanups uh, from nodes that are down and are not accessible uh, from other, so other nodes in, in that same cluster can do the cleanup. We also need a job distribution that is cluster aware and we need to move uh, operations uh, that are also tightly coupled with our architecture so they can support this cluster uh, uh, con concept. One of such is the replication operation that uh, is expecting only to, be one, to have one service providing the replication. Uh, there has been uh, people deploying Cinder Active Active for a long time. Some of them just uh, changed the host configuration option and set it to the same value in all, the, in all the services in the cluster. This was not good because whenever you added a, a new host to the, or node to the cluster, it will mess up all your, all your ongoing operations. Same thing would happen if you restarted one of the nodes that were already there, they will just break havoc in, in everything you, you had run in, in that cluster. There have been cases where it, this has been successfully done, the active-active, but they basically removed the cleanup mechanism from, the, from Cinder, and they either work with custom workloads or they, they use a shared uh, directory for the logs. Uh, we expect to have a tech preview of the active-active uh, uh, configuration in Nokata with some drivers supporting it, although some of, <laughs> some of these drivers may not support all the features. For example, they, they would require additional changes for the replication, so they may not get it in there, but we expect to have some. Uh, once we implement all the features we, we we are planning and doing for the active-active, um, we will be able to do advanced configurations like the one I explained there. Not much point explaining it. Not that relevant, but it will provide us, uh, basically we will be able to do any sort of configuration in active-active. The way we have solved these uh, different issues I mentioned is for the distributed lock-in, we are going to use TUS, which is an abstraction layer that will allow us to, to have those distributed locks with whatever uh, backend uh, the, the, the deployer wants. They may be using Zookeeper, etcd, uh, console, 
we don't care. That's why we use to, uh, tools to abstract from the current implementation. And it will be used in some operations in the Cinder Core, and some drivers may also need to use it, depending on how their backends work. Uh, for the job distribution, we will be using the same mechanism that the scheduler is using. We will move the logic of scheduling to the uh, message broker, and what we will create is a new couple of message queues and exchange. Um, uh, right now, with this implementation, the first approach will be that disabling a service will be in a at the cluster level, so you will not be able to disable uh, services within the cluster. You either disable the whole cluster or you don't disable. But in the future, we will allow independent service within the cluster to be disabled. For the cleanup mechanism, we will be using a new database table that will keep track of these uh, of the cleanable operations. So and not only the operation that is going on, but also who is doing the operation at, at each point in time. Uh, this will allow us a fine-grained uh, cleanup mechanism that will allow us not, not just to say clean up this cluster or clean up this service, but also, also we will be able to, to go to clean up only volumes, clean up these specific volumes, and things like that. So let's see how the, the workers table will work. We receive we receive a request uh, at the API level, and as soon as we create the, the, the volume entry in the database, we will also be creating a similar entry in the workers table that will reflect uh, the service that is working on it. The API will not get a representation. Uh, it will say no worker because, uh, uh, well, <laughs> It's not actually working on it, so. And uh, it will also reflect the status. Once it is sent to the scheduler, for example, upon reception, it will reflect that it has received the work and it's actually working on it. And same thing will happen when the volume receives it. It updates in case at that, this point it dies. We can know that, it, that we would have to do that cleanup. It will also get updated if a new cleanable state is set into the, into the resource. For example, when you are creating and you change to downloading, that's a new cleanable state. We have a, a couple of cleanable, like uh, deleting, creating, downloading. Not all re, uh, statuses uh, are cleanable at this moment. So whenever you change to one, you will also update the workers table to, to reflect this. And once you complete the operation, and you update to a stable status the resource, you will be delete, deleting the, the worker entry completely from the database. This is basically how we are going to be tracking it. Um, the Cinder Backup Service, since we decouple it in Mitaka, it already it, it supports now Active Active, uh, but it has a couple of limitations. For example, it, you only have one cluster for all your backups. So you can only have one back backend if you are deploying it in, uh, in decoupled mode. Uh, you also don't have um, a, a way to clean up resources that a node has been working on upon its death. You don't have an automatic way of doing it. You have to go resource by resource doing it manually. Um, um, that's basically, but this works in Active Active, which is good. Now we're going to, Michal is going to go over rolling upgrade, which is one of the features that will allow us to, your, the Cinder to be up and running all the time, basically. Um, I just thought that um, maybe not everyone is aware what the cleanup mechanism is. So it's, it's a mechanism that uh, on the Cinder volume service start looks for the uh, volumes in the or other resources in the in progress states like creating or downloading and uh, changes the status to error so the volume can be safely deleted. So that's, that's it and that was problematic because, because there is an assumption that uh, a single Cinder volume service owns a volume and that's, that's, there's only one service such, such service. Okay, 
So we're working on uh, rolling upgrades since Kilo, and it's all about uh, compatibility. Uh, so we need, we will need, during such upgrade, we need to run uh, services in different versions in a single environment. So we need to keep compatibility. And there are three layers of that compatibility. So the first one is the DB migrations compatibility. So the schema, the older versions need to still work correctly with the newer schema of the DB. Also, we need to keep uh, the API of the, uh, of the communication between services, the RPC API, uh, compatible. And same goes for the uh, payloads we are sending over RPC. For example, when returning or sending a parameters, uh, structure parameters like uh, dict structures. Uh, there are a few assumptions that are making it easier for us to support rolling upgrades. And that's the, uh, the upgrade order. It's API, then scheduler then volume and then backup service. Uh, you cannot uh, skip a release, so you can only upgrade one by one. No upgrade from Liberty to Newton in a live manner. You can do it um, by shutting down all the services and upgrading, no problem. Um, continuous deployment from master is allowed. That means uh, you, can, you can update to any commit uh, Mm, with some small limitations, you should, uh, if you are going to do that, you should look for the commit messages with upgrade impact flag and read what's there. Some commits require, are required to upgrade to before going uh, further. And of course, uh, live upgrade is possible only with HA deployment because we'll be shutting down some of the services, so you, you should have HA here. Uh, some more advices, so um, deploying each service in the container makes uh, it a lot easier because you are avoiding dependency hell. Uh, also, Cinder bases its uh, version detection in, uh, of, on the services uh, table, so you need to make sure that no old records are there. And uh, there's an uh, upgrade section in the release notes, and there's always a lot of useful notes on how to upgrade from a, release, from a previous release to the uh, to the one the release notes are about. And here's the upgrade procedure. So um, we are starting with HA deployment of Cinder in the X version. That's just a uh, picture task, this blue uh, boxes. And we want to move all the services to X plus one, which is this pinkish uh, boxes. Uh, so first thing to do is to apply the DB schema migrations. So as I said, we are making sure that the, that, uh, the migrations won't, uh, are not breaking the older services. So this should be a um, kind of easy step. And then we can start upgrading uh, with the correct order. So we are starting with Cinder API. You should probably get it out of the HA proxy, shut it down, upgrade, get it back again, get it back again in the, the HA proxy. And Cinder API will detect that it's, it's running in a um, with all the versions of the rest of the services and will downgrade all that communication to be uh, compatible with these versions. So you repeat the same step with all the Cinder APIs and then go to Cinder Scheduler, which is a little easier because we don't have HA proxy involved. So in this case, we are uh, relying on the message queue that it detects that Cinder Scheduler is go gone and don't uh, pass the requests there. Uh, so you are just upgrading it, putting it back again, and again it will detect the versions of all the services in the uh, environment and will downgrade all the communication to, to be compatible. And same goes for the rest of the schedulers. Then the Cinder volume is a little uh, more tricky because uh, you can only run one Cinder volume talking to a particular storage backend, as Gorka said previously. So there is some time that you won't have uh, Cinder volume, any Cinder volume in, the, in your deployment. If you will keep this uh, time uh, as short as possible, possibly shorter than the uh, service heartbeat timeout, then you are fine because Cinder schedulers won't notice that the Cinder volume is gone. And any request to that Cinder volume will be cached uh, or queued in the message queue. So uh, once the Cinder volume is back again, um, all the messages will flow to, um, flow to it and they will start to be processed. So this should introduce no interruption. Uh, and then Cinder backup service, which is also a little different because backups are kind of long running operations. I've heard about several hours to make a backup of a very big volumes. Uh, so before upgrading it, you want probably to disable it first. So it won't accept any requests. 
then uh, wait a reasonable am amount of time until it finishes all the requests. You can check the logs, for example, to see if it's still processing. Then proceed as we've seen the scheduler uh, turned it off, uh, upgrade it, and uh, you should also enable it again. So disable enable is the uh, service disable enable command of Cinder client. And you repeat that with all the Cinder backups. And there are two more steps to go. So the first one is uh, Cinder is caching the detected versions of services. So to make sure that the cache is invalidated and the version detection is run again, you need to restart Cinder app API service and uh, send signal sequence signals or restart if that's more uh, convenient for you. Uh, the rest of the services. And then the version detection uh, mechanism will ra be run again, and uh, all the services will realize that they are now running X plus one, and that's the completed upgrade. Uh, there's one more step that will be probably required in Newton to Akata upgrade and the next upgrades. Uh, so this is the same mechanism as uh, Nova has with online data migrations. So we are limiting data migrations in the initial migrations, to make sure that uh, these are uh, non-interruptive and they can be applied online. Uh, so there's a requirement that you need to upgrade uh, to uh, execute all the online data migrations uh, before upgrading to the next version. So in that uh, diagram, it's X plus two. And in this Newton Okata case, it would be before upgrading to Pike. And that's the, um, the compatibility table. So in, uh, it was impossible to upgrade Kilo to Liberty because we started working Kilo. And Liberty to Mitaka was manually tested, so we called it experimental. Uh, the Mitaka to Newton was uh, tested uh, on a CI, but non-voting one. Uh, I've called it experimental plus, but it, the CI was passing. It was okay. And Newton to Okata is supported and tested because every commit is now uh, checked for, uh, for upgradability. If it doesn't uh, introduce any incompatibilities and doesn't break the upgrade workflow, and this is a voting job, so no commit can break it now, hopefully. <laughs> I'll hand over to Gorka, who will talk about replication. Thank you. So I'm going to highlight just the replication feature in, in Cinder, which uh, is only meant version 2.1 to, to take care of one use case, a very specific one, which is the smoke hole case, where your whole uh, backend is gone somehow. And um, currently, it supports multiple uh, data replication uh, sites or disaster recovery sites, however you want to look at it. And we have two different types of uh, drivers. We didn't want to limit or force uh, backends into one way or another. So we, you, you can have drivers that do per volume replication. So you must specify, I want this volume replicated. And it can have both. And, uh, or you can have uh, drivers that have uh, per backend or pool replication. Um, the failover is not automatic. You have the sysadmin has to go in there and say, please failover or to any um, secondary um, backend or to one specific. After failover, as we would all assume, the replicated uh, resources will be available, but non-replicated will not. Uh, the way it worked is drivers report back to the schedulers uh, if they are capable of doing replication or not, and the scheduler uses this information to match it with the request from the, the client, uh, the API request, and, it, and schedule the, the volume creations according to, to whether you want them to be replicated or not. Um, uh, once we do the failover, the driver, what it does is change the, in the database uh, the required information to point to the new location uh, uh, changes depending on the drivers they may need to do changes in the backend to, to promote the secondary and um, the service uh, gets disabled by default you can re-enable it but by default it gets disabled so no new volumes are created there while version 2.1 is fully functional, there are some limitations 
that some of them will be wor working on them to fix them in this release. For example, OpenStack is not aware once you do a failover, so you will need to manually reattach your volumes. That's a big one. Uh, the, you cannot uh, force promo uh, promote your secondaries. They are always in failover state. Some of the drivers don't support failback. Uh, some of them do. We will try to make them all support it in this release. And we also have other kind of inconsistencies among drivers that we will also try to fix. Another big one is that the freeze mechanism doesn't actually work. The freeze mechanism is supposed to prevent any changes in your backend. You should be able to, to attach volumes and use the contents, deattach, but you should not be able to create, delete, uh, or migrate. That's, that was the idea. The problem is that it doesn't work. It, it only prevents the, the op operations that go through the scheduler from happening. Uh, now I'm going over some tips and tricks uh, to, to make your cloud either more reliable or reduce the downtime. Uh, there, and, until one or two releases ago, we had a, a big bottleneck uh, that was more quite visible. This would make in in Cinder, for example, when you were under a heavy load, you would get your attach and detaches could go from a couple of seconds to over two minutes to complete. This was a big thing, and the the problem was a bottleneck in the a con yeah a contention problem with the number of threads and the number of uh, database connection we had. And this happened in, in almost all the, the OpenStack services because we had uh, like 1,000 uh, green threads and only up to 15 database connections. So if the service required did a good amount of database connection, they would need to be queued and wait for others to complete. The solution was uh, to reduce the number of, of threats to uh, a smaller amount and to increase the maximum number of connections per service. Uh, in, in Nova, for example, it's only important for the, the conductor and the API, I believe, because everything, th those are the main ones that attack the database, but in Cinder, all our services go to the database, so it's important in all our services, our case. These are the configuration parameters that uh, can be set to adjust this. Uh, I would recommend using Rally if you have uh, uh, some way to, uh, you have a lab or something, you can actually characterize how uh, your workload would affect your database connections. So you can use Rally and Connection Monitor, which is a top-like um, program that will display in real time all the uh, connections from each of your services. So you can see how many are being used. Uh, an additional recommendation that Os Oslo DB is already doing is changing uh, from uh, MySQL Python library uh, to PyMySQL because this one allows monkey patching. So we will be able to work better our threads. Uh, one basic thing we all want in Cinder is when you do a stop, you want it to be done cleanly, and you expect it to be done cleanly, so usually what this entails is you either only stop the service or you disable and stop it, and you expect this to work. Uh, let's see. If we had um, a cloud that is under heavy load and Cinder is getting a lot of requests and we want to stop the services, uh, I will now see how stopping each of the services go. The scheduler, let's say you, you issue the system control stop and you look into the resources and you see, oh, everything is fine. So, yeah, not a problem. This should also work on the API, right? It worked on the scheduler. And oh, you run it and it doesn't work. You see that there are resources in attaching and detaching uh, status because the operation had failed. So what happened? Uh, what happened is that uh, system, system D, when you request the, the stopping, 
it is sending the signal terminal, the, the terminate signal to all the processes within that service, and this is not what should be happening. Uh, we need to send it only to the parent process, which will propagate it to the children properly. So we just need to change the service to, to set the queue mode. We try again and we fail. Still more errors. But well, in this case, less errors than before. And we see that only when it takes longer than 60 seconds, we see failures. And this is because, oh, we didn't know about the, the database connection contention. So we had an RPC timeout set to 80 seconds. And what happens is, is that after 60 seconds, the, the Cinder service has a graceful shutdown timeout. So if after 60, 60 seconds it hasn't completed, it will send a signal alarm to all the processes and stop them. Uh, recommendation, always set your graceful shutdown timeout greater than the RPC response timeout. So you don't get the, in, in this situation. So we, with all this knowledge, we try again and it still won't stop properly. So in this case, this is an event whiskey issue that leaves, for some reason, some uh, threads, evil in there. This is not a big problem because we, all operation will have already been completed. Uh, in this case, if you leave it at the default, it, the default is 90 seconds, so if we usually work with a RPC timeout of 60 seconds, this will not happen. But in other cases, if you are increasing it, you also have to increase this, uh, this, this timeout, because since there are, if we have increased the, the timeout of the internal, or the graceful shutdown, uh, then, and we request a stop, the, the um, system control, when you request a stop, it will weld, wait 90 seconds, which is the default value, and if, it, if the service hasn't stopped, it will escalate it to a kill signal, so it will get killed. For this service, for the API, as long as the other values are lower, it doesn't matter, because it's only idle threads that are making it not stop properly. The cinder volume is different because it, it's not only in the control path but on, also in the data path. So it performs long, long operations like creating a volume from an image if the image is huge and migrating volumes. So the default graceful shutdown time of 60 seconds will probably not be enough, will be insufficient. So we have two solutions. We either increase the timeouts to arbitrary numbers that we consider enough, or we just disable the escalation of the terminate signal to kill signal in the service, and we do, and we check it manually. So to prevent it, we will set kill mode to known, execute a stop, we will send the kill, the terminate. We will change graceful shutdown to a, a crazy number, like two days, it doesn't matter because we are actually going to check it personally, if the service has gone down. So we request the stop, we wait a little while, we check if, it, or we can script this to check if it has actually stopped the process. If it hasn't, we can check with a SQL query if uh, which resources are still being worked on. We can check the logs and see if the, um, if the operation is a stack, and if it's stuck, you can just send a force stop at any moment. Uh, in summary, you have to check your services, you have to check your timeouts, and be a little bit more careful. I would recommend setting those relations where the timeout of the system D is greater than the graceful shutdown. The graceful shutdown should be greater than the RPC sync uh, timeout. And uh, you can, if you change this on a running, the, how the services stop on a running uh, cloud, you can reload the daemon, so the, the next time you stop it, they, they are functional, and they will be properly stopped. Now, let's go into another thing that happens a lot of the time. You have your cloud running, and it's in info level, the logs are in info level, and suddenly you have an issue, and you wish they were on debug level, so you need to change them, but 
to change them, you need to restart the, the service. And as we saw, this is, a, this is not a trivial matter. And in the case of the cinder volume, it will probably disrupt if you want to stop them cleanly. It will restart, disrupt your whole um, service. So what we would like is a, a way to change the logs uh, into in less than a second, let's say, with as little disruption as possible. So I'm going to explain how to do it with GNU debugger. Uh, in a, it's a kind of hackish way, but it works. So what you do is you ask uh, GDB to run a Python script that will attach to the running process, which will stop it for a little while, like half a second or even less. And you run some Python code that it will change the log and you will detach from the process. This is not the nicest way to do it, but if the option is to stop your service for, let's say, half an hour, just to cleanly stop it so all operations are done in the cinder volume, uh, you may want to consider it. Uh, I don't use it, but I found it fun uh, doing it. Uh, it can be improved. No. You can use Sensible, you can set your overcloud to use a GDB server, so you don't have to inst install the whole GDB. Okay, and... We should probably skip this last uh, slide and go directly to the Q&A, which was we like four minutes. <laughs> All right, well, this is an easy one. This is just how, how Cinder detects the, that a service is down. Basically, the, the services report every 10 seconds, and if they haven't uh, reported anything after 60 seconds, they are considered down, and we can make it a uh, faster detection, but we should be careful with transient database error and the increased load on the database that we may be generating from this. So thank you, and if there are any questions, please, the microphone is there. Yep. I just need to show the slide. The legal guys told me to do so. Hi. Okay. Uh, so can I'm you explain uh, how it works in, on replication? When you have a volume on the primary site, does it only replicate changes uh, to the secondary volume or it replicates the entire volume? How does it work? Well, replication actually depends on the backend. You usually, the way it works is you have to configure your backend on its own, Cinder doesn't take care of configuring and setting the replication, the secondaries. So in the case, for example, in Ceph, you have to, to peer the secondaries with the primary. You have to make sure that journalism is enabled. You have to make some configurations so that they will get automatically uh, replicated if the correct parameters are, are passed from Cinder. So Cinder, all it does is when it receives a request from the scheduler that it wants a replicated volumes, it goes to the backend, the set backend, and tells him, okay, this volume, please add journal in and make sure that it's uh, being mirrored. So I don't know if that answered your yes. question. Great. Any more questions? I don't understand, sorry. Can you use the microphone? Uh, yeah, I'm a little deaf and <laughs> this is not helping. Okay, I would ask uh, about the HA clean up. Uh, you, just, um, you just talk about the clean up can be done in other load in your cluster, yes? Uh, so you mean, you mean on demand? Um, no, autom automatic cleanup. Oh, well, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. the, my first implementation did include automatic cleanup, okay. but I got so many minus twos that I decided to postpone it. <laughs> yeah. Everyone so uh, nobody wanted it, basically. Everybody said, no way. That's, nope. Not only that they didn't want to use it, they didn't even want it there. So I will try to fight that battle later on when all the other work is done. 
Okay, so oh, so uh, advice to you, cleaning up will not be done in the next release. <laughs> Uh, sorry. Uh, I mean, automatic, automatic yeah. clean up will not be done in next release. No, no, no. I don't okay. think so. Okay. Yep. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. The concept is scaring a lot of people of the automatically cleaning yeah. up in a distributed environment and messing with the status of resources. Yeah. I it, understand these people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I I actually set it in the in that patch to to be optional. Like by default is disabled, but did you, if you want to do it, you were setting, okay, I want automatic cleanup, and you would set a timeout, like, okay, don't start a cleanup immediately, give it like five minutes, I don't care, 10 minutes, whatever you decide. So it would, the schedulers would be checking, since they are already checking which services are this, uh, down, they would check it, check if the ti proper time has passed since the last uh, heartbeat was, Sent and they would trigger the, the automatic cleanup. So, so it is implemented, but you need to have to enable it. Well, no, it's not. Im no. I implemented it, but I, I, I abandoned the patch. Okay. Yeah. So it will be easy to get it back in there. <laughs> you can store it. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. Just a, a simple question about replication again. Um, I assume that there's like you have two Cinder backends, like. I'm thinking in context of Ceph. You have two Ceph clusters. You set up RBD mirroring between them. Yeah. The user, the interface is like the user selects that they want this volume replicated. Well, yeah. And then, and, and they have to have quota on the second. No, no, in, no. in How? no, no, the, the quota is managed by Cinder and the Cinder quota is the normal quota for the primary. The secondary, you have said the the sysadmin had already said that they wanted replica mirroring from one to the other, and in Cinder you don't add extra quota for oh, having replicated. it replicated. What you have is a special volume type. So if you want to charge extra for that volume type that says that it's replicated, you can do it, but you don't count it as double or triple if you add three replications. If that's ah, so you what you ask. You have a volume type which enables replication features. It's on the volume type uh, level. If, ah, okay. if it's on the volume type, yes. If you want, the, if you have different backends, one that are replicated and another that are not, and, and you define your types to specifically say if they are enabled or not replication, because you can say, okay, I have three, rep one volume type is replicated, so I said in the metadata like, Force that is replication enable is true, and in every other one I say replication enable false. You make sure that way, independent of if the backend is uh, per volume or per backend, it will only send to the replication backend the the ones that are meant to be replicated. But when you're when you're updating an existing installation, can you enable replication on existing volumes? You would need to retype the volume. You need to retype. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. Yeah, you can set the quota for the single volume type and then charge double. <laughs> so. Okay. Okay. Thank, Thank you, you very everyone. Much.